thank you all for coming. It's nice to have so many people here. Um, I'm Summer. I'm the curator here at the museum. Before we get started, everybody, please take a second to turn off or silence your phone so we don't have any disruptions. Um, we will be having a Mardi Gras membership party on February 18th. And if you're a member, you will be getting an invitation in the mail if you haven't already. Um, and as always, if you're interested in becoming a member, you can join here at the museum in person or online. And we have brochures at that back table by the door. Um, also, mark your calendars for April 8th because um, in partnership with Old Town, we will be having an Old Town home tour, kind of like holiday home tour. So um, more details about that will be coming out soon, so keep your eyes peeled for that. As for upcoming programs here, our February 3rd on 3rd on the 17th will be with Buddy Jacobs, who will talk about the history of the Amelia Island Fernandina Restoration Foundation. And then we're going to be having a special brown bag lunch on Tuesday, February 21st at noon. Um, Francis Gary Powers Jr. will be back to speak about his new book, Enemy Territory, the story of the CIA U-2 pilot Francis Gary Powers. Um, so that's it for announcements, but today we have Richard Tim. Richard is a co-founder of the Amelia Island Whale Ambassadors to provide education and awareness about right whales. He divides his time between Amelia Island and Bay of Fundy, both locations where right whales have historically been found. So everyone please welcome Richard. Summer, you sure know how to throw a party. <laughs> thank you. And thank you to the museum for hosting these. I, I've attended many of them. I just think it's fantastic. Uh, I'd also like to introduce uh, Candace Whitney, who's hiding behind that tablet back there. <laughs> Candace is the co-founder with me of the Amelia Island Whale Ambassadors. And, uh, so I'll, I'll be pointing Candace out a little bit later uh, when she's going to help us with something. Let's dive into it. The right whales of Amelia Island. Now, right whales, the North Atlantic right whales, they range up and down the east coast of, of, the, of North America. So, why do they come here? Why do they come here? Why are they so hard to see? That's something I'm going to focus on quite a bit. Why is this huge whale so hard to see? What are we celebrating? There is certainly a lot to celebrate, but we also worry, and we have hope. So let's go into those, uh, those topics. Why are they here? In a word, they're here to have their calves. And so, Summer, if you would jump ahead now to the next um, slide. You, you also have the thing. Oh, this little. Okay. <laughs> Bingo. But I can do it if you No, I've got it. <laughs> They're here because Amelia Island is in the heart of the calving grounds for the North Atlantic right grounds. So they'll be in Georgia, they'll be south of us. We're smack in the, in, in, in the middle. Uh, and, and that runs everywhere from November 15th to April 15th. So it's a fairly long, long time. Here is uh, Medusa and, and her calf. And they're just like, you know, cuddling up like, mother and calf. The mother is keeping the calf high in the water to breathe because it hasn't quite got the knack of swimming and breathing yet and so that's what we see happening here. So that's why they're here. There are some here for other reasons. We'll talk about that as well. But this is the main, main reason. So what are we talking about? Why are they so hard to see? This is a whale that's bigger than a bus. A lot bigger than a bus. And if we saw a bus going by the beach, we would know it. But we don't. These things are huge. Uh, they are the third largest whale. Right? You know the blue whale. You might know the finback whale. Those are the two larger whales. Look at this. When we're talking about a humpback whale, it's significantly smaller. If you're talking about an orca, famous orca, it looks like a minnow. Yeah. And a man, of course, you probably can't even see that. From a, it's, a, it's a huge whale. Why are they so hard to see? 
here's a, an eye test chart, but here's some of the key points. <laughs> One of the reasons they're hard to see is my first point. They're here calving. They're here whispering to their cats. They don't even make a lot of noise. We may talk a little bit more about that. They're conserving their energy to nurse the calves. Right? There's none of this theatrics that you're famous for, the humpback whales jumping out of the water and all, even that one that was here, the, the, the humpback running up and down the beach now. That's great, but it's not going to see, for the most part down here, you're not going to see a lot of activity. It's a baleen whale, and this one feeds on little, like, pieces of rice, little tiny cocoa pods, when they're in Canada. But here in Florida, they're not even feeding. <laughs> there's, there's nothing here for them to eat. The humpback does eat little fish, and so it's out there just going kind of right up and down for dolphins, and it's like a party. But for the right whale, no, they're not even here feeding. They're mostly black. That certainly doesn't help, right? They're the petrol flippers, the little side flippers. They're little short, stubby things. Unlike a you know, humpback whale, you know, they roll on, and Candace and I were on the beach the other day, and we said, oh, I think there's a whale, and I think he rolled on the side, and big arm goes up, and says, yeah, it's me, I'm out here again. <laughs> that's your humpback. Uh, no, that's not really going to happen that much with a, uh, with a right whale. No dorsal fin, just flat on top, nothing happening there, uh, and they move very slowly. They can be near shore. They can be far from shore. This chart shows every one of those dots is a whale sighting this year. <laughs> this year. So there are airplanes going back and forth and back and forth. Most days, mm, probably averages out every other day. And when they see a whale, now that this might be the same whale sighted more than once, but nonetheless, that's a lot of whale sightings, you don't know where they're, um, kind of close to shore here, but not really close enough to see. Uh, last year, we had more dots close to shore, and we had a good time uh, watching some of the, the right whales. Yeah, they can be near, they can be far, you just never, never know where they're going to be. So that's why they're so hard to see. But when we do see them, we can celebrate, particularly when they're with the calves. This year so far, we have uh, 11 mother-calf pairs. The distinction by saying mother-calf pairs is you may have heard of the other calf that was found just by itself and subsequently it passed. So they don't really count lone calves. It very rarely happens, but they don't really even count them because they're just not going to make it. Uh, 11 right whale mother cousin. That is really wonderful. Every one of them uh, gets cataloged and photographed and we, and, we and we celebrate that. We celebrate that, but we also worry. And we worry a lot. The population right now of North Atlantic right whales is estimated to be about 340. And then start breaking that down. You know, cut it in half if you want to do simple math. Half for male, half for female. Cut that in half again. Half for breeding, half for not. You get to about 70 breeding females right now. But the t interval between calves has been growing and growing for reasons that we'll talk about. And so now it's more like six, seven years between calves. So if you have 70 breeding females and six, seven years between calves, you're not going to get a lot of calves. Right, so that's a, that is quite a problem. That's one of the things we worry about. 20 calves a year, approximately, are needed just to sustain the population. Not to grow it, to sustain it. You'd have to get 30, 40, 50 to significantly grow the population. Well, I said so far we have 11. I think we'll get some more. Some of those dots uh, on the prior slide were lone adult calves. So hopefully there are some more calves yet to come. 
we had, maybe we can match last year's 15 casts, right? We had 18 in 2021. So you're not seeing any big numbers there for, for cows. That's reason to worry. Then you have issues such as entanglement. Entanglement in lobster and crab trap gear kills whales. And right now, it's the leading cause of death to the whales. The whales, as far as the researchers tell us, they never find them dying of natural causes anymore. They, they might happen, but we just don't find them. When they wash up on the beach, it's because of entanglement, because of the next reason, boat strikes. That's the second leading, leading cause. And a boat strike can be a really big boat, but it can be recreational boats. Uh, those are the two leading causes right now. And the other issue we have is the cumulative effects of stress. Stress particularly due to noise. These wells, it was one of the things that I had to think about a little bit when I was reading about whales and they talked about, we generally see whales alone. You know, oftentimes you see whales, certain kinds of whales you see it alone. And they said, but they aren't alone. Their sound can travel miles. In them. So they can be talking to a whale that's way far away saying, fish over here. <laughs> right? <coughs> and that, then you put all sorts of shipping noise and oil explanation noise, wind power noise, and other noise like that in the water. And it gets to the point they can't hear each other. So it's clearly a huge contribution to stress. Also, is if you have been hit by a propeller, now maybe you're injured, that's stress. If you've been dragging around lines and traps and things like that, you might not be dead, but you're definitely under, under stress. And those are the things that just keep adding up to weakening the population, making it a lot harder for the females to gain enough energy to be able to have calves, thus those longer times between calves. Yeah, these are the things we worry about. Lastly, we worry about the protections that are supposed to be in place uh, aren't yet working as well as they should. And here we see, as, there, as recently as July of 2022, a judge, federal judge saying no. The, the, the weak protection for vanishing whales violates the law. The weak protection violates the law. So clearly there is, is work to do. So we worry. I mentioned entanglement. Here's a, a, a picture. This is one whale, which I'll tell you right away is still alive, okay. from what I can see, uh, Rufian. But Rufian dragged this crab trap and all this rope wrapped around. I mean, here it looks nice and pretty. It's clean. These guys are smiling. That's not what it looked like when they found this well and this rope was like a harness going through its mouth and wound into the baleen. And when a, when a whale, or really any fish, gets a line wrapped around it, first thing it seems to just naturally do is start rolling. So here's this line. It's just wrapped and wrapped around them, and then it gets on the fins. And then now you have this thing dragging so if you put dragging on a line, it's just pulling tighter and cutting into the animal. And then the lice get on it and everything. It's a heck of a way to die. Fortunately, this one didn't die. <coughs> Neither did this one. This is Nimbus, January 20th, 2023, a few days ago. So this is another reason why uh, whales are, are down here. There are sometimes male whales down here. Uh, I'm surprised the number of entangled whales that we're hearing about came down this year. And maybe it's just a theory, but I've heard folks, uh, some of the experts, talk about the whales know they can't really feed very well.
pile up north with all this line in them, and they're getting cold in that water, and so they come down here. That you know, may be a theory, but certainly this year, the disentanglement teams have been quite busy. So this is the team. Look at all of these. You can't read it, but every one of those are people from Georgia and Florida. No one, they work together to disentangle the wells. So there's a lot of people working to try to save the, the wells. I don't want to leave anyone the impression that disentanglement is just an easy solution. It's not. If you think about it, first you have to find the web and find it again. Somebody spots it and says, there's a entangled web. Now we have to go out and find it again. In the morning. <laughs> because you're going to be out there a long time. The thing, you know, you need calmer seas would be, be nice. You get a team out there, and it's a very specialized team. It's hard work. It is risking their own lives. Yes, we have had disentanglement uh, teams lose people. So disentanglement is not just an easy solution to, to, to this. And it's happening down here as, uh, uh, as well. Um, I mentioned boat strikes. Here are some photos from the, the NOAA and the FWC in Georgia. <coughs> Three boats, each hit a whale. I think in all those cases, but certainly at least one, uh, a calf. Killed the calf, injured another, and sank the boat. So if you have a million dollar boat, I don't think you really want to sink that by hitting uh, a whale. It really is going to be a bad day for you and the whale. The, uh, yeah, so we though also are hopeful. We truly are, are, are hopeful. I say we created the problem, we can fix it. it they, I never heard this word anthropological, I think that's the word, uh, which means man made causes. I never heard that word until I started getting involved with, with, with whales. And as I already said, they don't die of natural causes. They die of man-made causes. We created the problem. We can fix it. And the population is down now to what it was in uh, 2001. So the population had come back up. I can't use the word rebounded, but it had come back up. In 2001, it was down to where it is now. And in the ensuing decade, the population increased about 150 wells. And we've eroded all of that <coughs> back down to that population of 2001. So maybe we can rebound again. I said a lot and I showed you about entanglement. Well, there are solutions to that. There are traps, there's technology in use that you put a trap down with the rope inside the trap, and then you're able to hit a little quicker and communicate with that trap, release the rope, and the float com comes up. So maybe I should draw a little picture. When we say traps and ropes, what we're talking about is the traditional buoy on top of the water, a rope going down to a trap. Sometimes it's a buoy to a trap and then connecting to another uh, bunch of traps and then another line up. The other places, maybe it's just one line and one buoy per trap. So if you're a whale trying to come in now to where there are a bunch of traps, and sometimes they're really close together. I mean, as Summer said, we live up there in the Bay of Fundy, and we've seen the trapping. And I don't even know how they get a boat through there without getting it wrapped around a propeller. So that's the visual, a lot of buoys, a lot of ropes, a lot of traps, and you're a whale trying to <coughs> swim through there. Well, now they have ropeless or on-demand traps. And one of the things I find really interesting about these ropeless on-demand traps is <coughs> it's not just about right whales. There are lots of fisheries. One of the manufacturers of these on-demand traps is out there in California for the Dungeness crab fishery. Right? And you have gray whales out there and other whales out there. So 
you know, there are many other places that need this technology. One of the places it's, it's being uh, accepted is right here in the Carolinas, where you have the um, black drum, see if somebody help me on that, but uh, fishery where they fish with traps. And right now they have to go out like 30 miles to set those traps with ropes and buoys. But if they use ropeless, they can be in a lot closer. So if you're a fisherman, you're like, well, that's easy. I don't want to waste all that gas and time going out 30 miles if I can just use ropeless. But ropeless must be deployed much more. It needs more support from our governments and funding. Because if you're a fisherman, you're not sitting around with a whole lot of money just to go replace all of your traps and your technology. So we need to work together. And that's one of the messages I, I, I try to convey working together. If we just demonize the fishermen, this is going nowhere. But if we can work together and collaborate, yeah, we could win. Speed reductions. Speed reductions are effective. We know that. It used to be that boat strikes was the most common form of, of, of death for the, uh, for the right whales. But now it's entanglement. Why? Because Speed reductions have been effective, but right now uh, speed reductions apply to ships 65 feet or, or larger, and they go at 10 knots. And from what I understand from the captains, this has been around now long enough that it's just a groove swing. They know what they're going to do. They enter a seasonal management area. They come in on a boat channel. They radio in, and they just hit the 10 knots, and they go. And this is kind of this routine now. So it's working. <laughs> But as you saw on the other slide, smaller boats can sink uh, a boat and kill the whale. So we need to, you know, there are proposals of, of trying to reduce the speeds of, of there. Individuals, us, we all need to stay 500 yards away from, from the whales. That includes boats, it includes kayaks. You see me out on a kayak sometimes. You'll never see me on a paddleboard, but yes, <laughs> uh, you have to say. 500 yards away, drones even, in the air. Oh. The video you saw uh, when you came in, that was shot with a super telephoto drone, very far away. I really like the guy who introduced it. He actually drones out and says, there's the sheriff, and it just points out how that whale and calf were being protected so, so much. Yeah, 500 yards away, so that will help if we do that. And there's so much more interest now in protecting the North American right whales. You know, I showed you even in that one slide, there were so many people involved in that one disentanglement effort. If you're here, if you're new, in November, we have the right whale festival here in town. So if you're new to the area, make a note, first weekend in November, right whale festival, and you'll see an amazing number of people who are out there working to conserve the North Atlantic right whales. So you can help too, absolutely. So now let's kind of pull it all together. Some of the key messages here. Millie Island, the heart of the North Atlantic right whale calving grounds. Right? And we've emphasized that they're huge, they're awe-inspiring, but they are very hard to see. Highly endangered, only 340 remaining. Populations continuing to decline, that's not good. With uh, entanglement and boat strikes being the main causes of, of, of death. But let's be hopeful, they can be saved. We talked about the ropeless, on-demand fishing traps really, uh, they work. And we spent, at the Right Rail Festival, there was a <coughs> lobster <coughs> trapper from Canada who came down <coughs> with one of those traps, with the rope inside the trap, mm -hmm. and demonstrated how this thing is, is, is working. And he's up in an area in Canada where the fishing is closed unless you're using the ropeless trap. So, <laughs> Look, it's, there's a lot of lobster down there. <laughs> and if you're the only one with a ropeless trap, you're doing pretty good. 
Uh, and we talked about the speed reductions. We also said you can make a difference. Here are some of the things you can do. What can one person do? Well, you can join me, you can join Candace. We have the uh, <coughs> Mini Island Whale Ambassadors. There's a growing number of people who have, uh, have joined us, expressed interest in that. So Candace has some little uh, flyers uh, about our team. <coughs> you can certainly assist with local initiatives. You can assist with that festival in November. They need lots of volunteers for everything. So yes, that's one of the things you can do. You can attend Right Whale Spotter Training this Monday. Uh, February 6th will be in the evening, 6 to 7 will be virtual. Um, no, Monday the 6th. Uh, but if we happen to be wrong, don't worry. Um, Candace has some sheets where you can sign up and just say, yes, I want to attend. And then we'll email you the link and the correct date. <laughs> Pretty sure it's the 6th, though. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> what's going to happen there is, is I, I've kind of moved through quickly here. Julie Albert, though, will spend about an hour going into a lot more detail about the whales, the, the sightings of the whales, I mean, what you're looking for, how do you really know. Because, you know, the other day when Candace and I were called to the beach, someone said, well, there's a right whale out here. And so down we go, spotting scope, binoculars, no whale. And then eventually, like I said before, along comes this whale and gives us the humpback <laughs> wave. And we said, ah, it wasn't a right whale, it was a humpback. Then we learned that the airplanes, the airplanes came over and they said, no, actually there was a right whale down there. But it, by the time we got there, it had already moved so far out we couldn't see. So there, it was a busy day on the beach, evidently. <laughs> So that's the kind of thing that you will be learning in that training. Uh, one of the benefits of participating in the training is then you go on a, a hot list that if a whale is seen from the shore, then you can be notified and then you can go down and, 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 and see it. If you do see a right whale, you can give a call to the MRC. Do you have any of those little yellow cards? Yeah. So if anybody wants a little pocket card with this number, uh, Candace has uh, those. Another thing you can do is if you're out on the water, if you know anybody's out on the water, encourage that they go pretty slow. You'd love to see everyone going 10, 10 knots, but definitely going slow is it, it, going to help. And lastly, and perhaps more importantly, it's just to tell others what you heard today. You know, when you're out to dinner, you say, I attended this presentation, and it was amazing. Let me tell you about it. These things are bigger than a school bus. And then go to the link and see the whole thing. Yeah. So <clears throat> that's the prepared material we have. Uh, I can always launch into other things. So let me give you a chance for some questions, if there, if there are any. Yes, please. Um, once you see a whale, do they have a pattern? Do they stay in the area and just go north and south so you might be able to see them going back and forth? Yes and no. Uh, <laughs> last year, the, the, the one, we saw it repeatedly. It just was hanging around. But others, no, they'll just seem to go down. There was one, one year, I uh, don't remember the name right off, but it decided to go all the way down around the end of Florida and up into the Gulf. So that's why I say yes, and yes, and yes, and yes, and no. Yeah. Ooh, a lot of hands. Yes, ma'am. Um, question. They're finding a lot of whales washing up the shore, say, in New Jersey. Yep. And the problem is they're not getting the windmills. And the sonic, as I understand, the sonic noise that they're making mm -hmm. underneath the water. And people are thinking this is the green thing. It's killing. I mean, it's actually right. detrimental to the whales. Yeah, it is. It is really surprising the number of whales that have washed up this this year. Um, and even let's you talked about New Jersey, but here even let's talk about here we had that orca that washed up. We had a pygmy sperm whale wash up. Um, 
the, the, well, the humpback hasn't washed up. It's just swimming around. I mean, there has been one in the last few years that washed up. They dug. Yes, there was that. There was that young one that, that washed up here. Uh, so even here, that's happening, and I, I don't know exactly the reason, but I, I certainly. People think they're being green. Yeah. And you're actually destroying the wildlife and. They're having a big problem up north, and people don't yep. realize, oh, they're just digging and putting in a windmill. That's not <coughs> what the prep board is destroying them. That's, that's, that's why I mentioned the, the, the noise stress on here. Yes, and noise stress. It, it, yes. it, 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 it just, there's a, there's a book called um, Whale Wars, mm -hmm. and it documents the research that was done into just that, the effect of sound uh, on, on, on the whales. And these, beak, these were beaked whales, of which there are many different kinds. In fact, one just washed up there in uh, Louisiana or something. Uh, again, it's often noise is the yes. problem. But th so this, th this is, a, I really encourage this book if anyone is interested. It's called Whale Wars. And I, I let me try to position it this way. It sounds like uh, it, it's like a big focus on what the Navy was doing with large sounds, to the point that the Navy now requires this book as part of its education for its officers and so on. So that you know that, that they that they learn this is this is a real real problem. There were a lot more hands here. I shouldn't keep going. How are we doing on time? We've got 30 minutes. Oh, we have a lot of questions. <laughs> Does the International Whaling Commission help you at all with the right whales? Well, they've outlawed whaling. Yeah. <laughs> but did they help with, uh, you know, you're, you're kind of a local group, because I know that they're a worldwide organization. Yeah. Do they have any input or any help for... I'm not aware of that right, right off. But I, there are so many groups that are that are uh, involved. Candace is holding up an article uh, about a boat that you may have noticed right here in the at the marina called the Song of the Whale, and they were from uh, England. So it's not the IWC, but they came over from England, and the, the uh, reason they were here is. Well, they said the name of the boat is Song of the Whale. And so what they're doing is uh, research, uh, audio research, into the sounds of the whales. And they were the ones who we were talking with. And they said, yeah, these guys are actually just out there whispering and trying to cause, cause very little attention to them, themselves. So yeah, a lot of organizations working uh, on, on this. And that was uh, iPhone. Fund for They're the ones who taking a big step yep. into uh, helping the right will. And this, this boat is going to do some amazing things. Hmm. Yeah, I, they, the, I, I, the International Fund for Animal Welfare is <coughs> the one that funded the song, the song of the whale. Ma'am? Yes, I wonder about the disentanglement process. Does the whale, when you're out there, that picture, does the whale? <coughs> So I've never been involved uh, with the disentanglement. What I've heard is it kind of depends on the whale. Um, humpbacks tend to be a lot more social, and they seem to get it. They know what's going on. You're here to help. The right whales, not so much. They'll fight you. And uh, so that's again why I'm saying it's really unsafe to, to be to be out there uh, disentangling. The highly trained teams, very specialized equipment. Uh, if you see one, so this is what happened last year, I think it was. Uh, there was a whale here with a calf and a rope running right through its mouth out the other side. Somebody went out on a kayak <laughs> and said, I'm going to help, and cut off a piece of this rope. Certainly risked 
his own life being out there in a car, totally violated the 500 <laughs> yard sailway. And what he didn't realize is he was actually making it harder for the whale for this reason. <clears throat> when the disentanglement team removed the original ropes, they realized they couldn't get that one out from the bailing. So what they do is cut it short on one side and leave it long on the other. And that just does a, has a natural effect of when it's swimming, causes more drag on that long side and eventually works that rope, rope out. So if you, your, your question, it's a really great question, uh, you could die and you could be doing even more damage to uh, the whale if you go out and try to cut this off. Sir? Uh, two questions. Do the whales have natural predators? Yeah, that's a good question. And, and I noticed you have names for the whales. Do you go out and fin print them so you know? Them? Okay. Um, natural, natural predators. Occasionally, when they're doing a necropsy, they'll say, oh, there was like a shark uh, bites or something like that. One of the reasons the whales like to be down here and come even in the shallow water is then there's less likely to be uh, sharks. This is what I've been told. So, yeah, but for the most part, no, it's not natural predators. Man. Well, yes. And then... Um, you asked about the names uh, and how they fingerprint them. Okay. Uh, if we go all the way back to this slide in the beginning here, I think you might be able to see these white dots up here. And these are called callosities. And they form a, I heard somebody say lice. That's, that's true. It's, well, lice is why it's white. Um, it's kind of like, uh, yeah, where you have like natural patches of people. We have natural patches where we might have hair that we really don't want. Um, <laughs> that's what that's what is happening here, and then the lice get on there, and that's why it's white. Those patterns are unique per whale, and that's why to, the aerial surveys are so important because they're trying to get a vertical view. <coughs> Uh, and where drones have been so helpful these days now is to get a vertical view of the whales and then they can go back to the New England Aquarium, that's where the catalog is kept, and they can study that. The names, uh, the names are really, a lot of them don't have a name, but the names are trying to help them uh, identify the whales. You know, I see that shape. The whale I was talking about that was out here and had the line that the kayaker worked with. That was um, salt, was it? Snow, Snow cone. cone. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> good. That was a test. I told you. <laughs> um, so the shape gave, they said, oh, it looks like a snow cone. All right. Yes, ma'am. Uh, can you tell me how long the average gestation period is and how long the calf stays with the mother? It's a year gestation period. Mm -hmm. and how long does the calf stay with the a little bit longer after that. And it used to be that the, they could calf every three years. So I don't know the exact timing. I know it's a year gestation. The other, then the calf is going to stay around somewhat longer than that. But then that mother needs to get to work, start build up its energy, and, and then it'll be able to calf again. So that used to take three years, the whole cycle. Yes? Um, is there a site that you can actually read about the necroscopy or the Hmm. I don't. Uh, that specific question, I don't know. There are a lot of resources and you know sites, of their, but on that specific item, I don't. Because I know an article just came out about those nine whales along the northeast coast, and it said it was blunt trauma. It wasn't. Really, they, they died. The nine died from blunt trauma. Oh dear. Wow. That was a newspaper article. That was that seems odd, but okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, the. Uh, I mentioned the New England Aquarium. I know they have Woods Hole, maybe uh, Woods Hole, perhaps. Uh, also NOAA. Yeah. They have, you know, news and sometimes we bulletins like 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 that. Interesting question. Yes. Have they seen snow cones? 
This season? No, we think Snow Cone has passed. Aww. When uh, when we were up, my wife Lisa here, when we were up in Canada, uh, it was seen up in the St. Lawrence, and already it, it was re-entangled. Just really. Then they saw it came down off of Cape Cod, uh, and it was even worse. And, and that was months ago, and they said, they just said no, this, this whale only has short time to live. So I'm, a, I'm making an assumption here, but that's what we thought. Yes? Uh, two years ago, my husband and I were up by Fish Park oh, yep. on the Rainbow area, and there was a small, it was either a pygmy whale and whatever, and they tried to get it off the beach, and yeah. they, it was a big process, and the team that was there, it didn't make it, but the team that was there to take it, and they did an autopsy, they said that the biggest cause for that, at least that type of a whale was um, plastics, mm -hmm. and yep. so, I don't know. That uh, beaked whale that washed up there in the Gulf, they found plastics inside. They didn't, at that point, they didn't know if that was the cause of death, but you're right, plastics is, yeah. is an issue. Peggy? Yeah, well, as you know, these same whales, you know, they'll be off the coast of Nova Scotia and Newfoundland, and that's a long way from <laughs> Newfoundland to Florida. So are there groups like yours along the coast all the way along so that you know it's a long way to swim without having advocates in the water for you because you've got to have you know the uh, 10 knots um right. needs to be enforced along the trip uh -huh. and how long does it take a right whale to go from say Newfoundland to Florida? Yeah, I don't know how long it takes to come down. I know that there is a savanna has a growing uh, group there, and then sort of around that, a larger team in, 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 in Georgia. I really don't know so much elsewhere, uh, but you're right. It, the more I, you know, it's I think that, that sort of the grassroots teams like us we would make a difference. I mean, that's why we do this. If we didn't think we were making a difference, we wouldn't do this. Uh, we work together. Those of you who helped support us financially, thank you. And one of the things we did with that was create signage. Created this sign. And brought it to the marinas from here all the way down to Ponce Inlet. Oh, okay. uh, the, the marinas that have the really, the really big boats. It wasn't every marina, but the marinas with the really big boats. So that's kind of what we're trying to do uh, locally. I would love to see them right up and down the eastern seaboard, but no, I can't really answer that. Yes? That, that sign triggers a uh, question. Recreational boaters and the smaller boats on other bodies of water, we recognize it's impossible for many people to recognize that they should be paving and following rules. <laughs> what strategies do you have to address that group? Continue. As Summer said, what we choose as our mission, the main unwell ambassadors, is education and awareness. And so the answer is to, to continue with things like this. And now there's about 120 more people who are going to go talk <laughs> to the other people. And, you know, the, the signage, the, the festival itself, things like that, just to continue to increase uh, awareness. I want to give a huge shout out to the news leader. They're doing a marvelous job, in my opinion. I hope you're here, but I don't know. Um, in, in just keeping the information front and center about the, the, the whales, yeah. Richard, do you have the video of the, um, the, the mom with the camera on her back? Sure, do you want to bring that up? Yeah. So this is a video, uh, one of the things that people say is, why don't you just tag all the whales and then you know where they are? <laughs> well, you can't do that. Uh, they don't have a dorsal fin, you don't oh, want to yeah. put something that's going to be 
like penetrated inside the whale. But here, what they did uh, is, is they they just attached temporarily, like a GoPro, basically, to this whale. It's going to say earlier in the day, and see if he goes boop. <laughs> Turn it on. And, and what is so interesting here is when this whale comes up to the surface, you see it hardly disturbs the water at all. So this goes back to our saying, why is it so hard to see these things? Look at this. Yeah. If you're yeah. out there in a boat, the chance of you seeing yeah. that yeah. is pretty, pretty. You know, when we were, we were helping the state try to find snow cone a year ago out here. So we were on the shore with our scopes. We knew right where the rail was. FWC went out with a boat. That means you got people who know what they're looking for. They were up in an aerial tower, so they're high up. And they knew there was a whale there because we were telling them there was a whale there. And they could not find the whale. And eventually, you know, the guy's name was Tom. He said, Tom, it's just to your right, like just to the south. And eventually he says, oh, yeah, I found it. That's how hard it is. Said, Look at that. It's just hardly cutting the water at, at all. How fast did they get? Um, they generally, I don't know the exact speed, but it, it, it tends to be pretty slow. Six miles. Yeah, like, that's, that's a good, good enough figure right there. Yes? What is the lifespan of the Today they're saying. Well, it, they're saying up to 70 years. Let, let me give you two answers. The official, if you look at the NOAA website, it's going to say up to 70 years. I don't know. I, they die so much due to uh, man-made causes, we really don't know what the natural lifespan is. A bowhead is 200 years. And it's basically the same whale. It's very similar. It's not exactly the same. They have a big head. And they, you know, up in the Arctic, there's food all the time, so they're eating all the time. They don't go to the Bahamas to have babies and stuff. <laughs> they can live 200 years. So, I don't know, just me. I'm saying, is 70 really right? I think naturally they might be able to live longer. But 70 is the number you'll read in, in any official place. Reading of that, like how it takes 10 years until they can have their first. So now start doing the math. 70 years, take off the first 10 years, and now you got 60 years. In, in ideal perfect conditions, it would be every three years they could have one. But now it's probably going to be more like six or seven. So Maybe at tops they could have 10 calves now. Yes? Are they right whales found throughout the world? Yeah, they but are. But do they travel from one particular area to other? No, no. There are three populations of right whales. So we have been talking today about the North Atlantic right whales. And the North Atlantic right whales are now uh, pretty much only seen along our coast. Uh, once upon a time, they were on the other side of the Atlantic. Mm. Then there's the southern right whale. And the southern right whale is actually doing fairly, fairly well. Oh. So the southern hemisphere. Um, and then there's another small population of uh, Pacific right whales. And that's really endangered. Yes? So you say that the whales are coming close to the shore and being very hard to see. Are, could they be a threat to a human if you're in the water and come upon? I don't so much think so. Uh, the threat would be this. If, it, it's kind of like if you spook any animal. If, if it lets go with that tail, you're toast. Because this, this is tons of tail that's coming down on you. So, yeah, I would not want to do that. <laughs> um, of course, the chances of you coming upon a floating school bus is pretty <laughs> But it's a reasonable, that's what I said, the guy who ground went there with a kayak, is like, God, no, what were you thinking? But I know what he was thinking. Well, he's got a rope, and I'm going to go and try to help. I know what he was thinking, but he really could have gotten himself in big trouble. Yes? Yes, Richard. Uh, 
What got you interested in the right whales? And how long have you been doing it? Uh, what got me interested in the right whales, I had a general interest in whales. And then when we found ourselves on the Bay of Fundy and learned that right whales were there, and then we moved here, I said, right whales are here. I said, well, it's kind of obvious that we're being called to be involved with right whale con conservation, and that's it. I've been doing it right well focused two, three years. Not, not a real long distance. We moved here in uh, 17, and then just flowed from, from there. Yeah, thank you, though. Any other questions? I know we're really getting long. Um, do we have another video? Yeah. We can let... Oh, yeah, this is that slide. This is cute. This is the image I had of Medusa. But now look at the, see the actual video. Oops. And you can just leave that looping. Um, I'll tell you again, Candace is back there with the sign-up sheet which she's holding. Uh, that would be for if you want to be invited to the training on what we think is Monday. <laughs> and, then, and then those cards. <laughs> Uh, and, the, and the little yellow cards. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. thank you all for coming, and we hope to see you at the third on third on the seventeenth.